Frances Stroh was born in Detroit and raised in Gross Point, Michigan. She received her BA from Duke University and her MA from Chelsea College of Art in London as a Fulbright Scholar. She practiced as an installation artist, exhibiting in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and London before returning to the practice of writing. Frances is a member of the San Francisco Writers Grotto and her work across all media explores issues of identity, point of view, and the mythologies that define us. Toby Barlow is Chief Creative Officer at Team Detroit, the founder of Writer House Foundation, and author of two novels, Baba Yaga and Sharp Teeth. And now, Francis Stroh and Toby Barlow. I'm, I'm Toby. Welcome home. Thank uh, you. It's excellent to be back in Detroit. Yeah, it's wonderful it's to have you. It's very happening these days. It's very different than it was when you left it in your book. When you left off in your book and went away, it was sort of at a nadir moment, at, you know, sort of at the bottom. So it must be inspiring to come back and see what's going on here. Extremely inspiring very vibrant and actually quite overwhelming in terms of the self-reinvention that Detroit's undergone. I hadn't been downtown in five years um, up until last October when I was here at MOCAD for an 826 Michigan event and stayed downtown and have been talking about it ever since as this incredible story, this American story of reinvention that gives all of us hope, actually, because if Detroit can turn around this quickly, I think any city in this country can, as long as it gets the attention that Detroit's been getting. Well, we'd like to keep, keep the attention on us for as long as possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe there's enough attention to go around. We'll have to find out. We'll find out. <laughs> Uh, did you want to start off by reading a little bit just to kind of set the mood and get people sort of settled to the tone of your voice? I loved this. I finished it about a month ago, and I thought it was a, a mo brave, moving. Um, you know, it, it evoked a lot of memories for me. Probably anybody in this audience who reads it will find, because, because I think you put so much of your own humanity into it, um, people will find something in it that they can reflect on. Uh, but it'd be wonderful to have you begin and, and, and share a little bit of it with us. I'd be happy to. Um, the section I decided to read has been um, affectionately referred to in some press as my Hare Krishna encounter with Annie Lennox. <laughs> so let's see. I think there may even be one or two people present tonight who are with me when this happened. It was a dark morning in January that the wreck had happened. Parting our way through the inevitable depression of a Michigan winter, my friends and I had been out all night, then attended a sunrise meditation class at the Hare Krishna mansion in Detroit. The Krishna Center was located on the sprawling estate of the Fisher Mansion, one of the old Detroit houses emblematic of the automotive industry's heyday, donated to the sect by Alfie Ford. Meditation, music, drugs, and alcohol, they were all facets of the same mind-expanding trajectory, especially potent when combined. My friends and I had all read On the Road and the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, and with the help of state-of-the-art amphetamines and a healthy dose of cynicism, we had taken the legacy of the 50s and the 60s to new heights in the 80s. The Corinthian pillars of the meditation hall were edged in gold. A robed, pot-bellied man with a Krishna ponytail sat lotus-style facing the large group. We sat down in our stocking feet and tried to look spiritual. Sweet-smelling incense burned in all four corners of the vast room. 
And now the chanting began. I glanced around at the other meditators as their voices rose. A beautiful woman with a shock of buzzed orange hair was sitting alongside us, cross-legged. Annie Lennox, her knee just inches from mine. Recognizing her immediately, we broke into ecstatic, wide-eyed smiles. We were living a cultural moment, absorbing her palpable aura of celebrity, metabolizing a cocktail of gorgeous chemicals, chanting. We had finally arrived. Annie was stunning, younger than we would have thought, and amazingly, a real person. Her voice converged with ours like a train escalating to the heavens, echoing off the Baroque gold-leafed ceiling of the Fisher Mansion ballroom with the rapturous beat of life itself. After the meditation class, my friends and I popped coding tabs to soften the landing, then trudged through the snow back to my father's car. The roads were thick with ice. The overcast January sky hung low like the dark concavity of an overturned bowl. I started the engine. Road conditions never worried me, even in blizzards. I could drive on ice blindfolded. I accelerated quickly, skidding against the curb. Whoa, everyone shouted, laughing. They smoked and debated the age of Annie Lennox, seatbelts still unbuckled. The lawns were buried under filthy old snow. No other cars on the road. I accelerated again, feeling the pedal give obediently beneath the stiff leather sole of my right cowboy boot. Brick houses with past us in blurs of reddish brown. The car heater roared with cold air. I pulled a Marlboro from my pack. No one could find the lighter, so someone in the back seat just held out a lit cigarette. I turned around and leaned into the back, my left hand still on the wheel my starved lungs drawing on that fragile point of light with mighty focus, the last burning ember within miles. But my cigarette didn't catch right away, and that's when it happened. We slammed to a stop with a great exploding sound, our bodies thrown backward as if from an electric shock. Then everything stopped again. A telephone pole I saw stood inches from my face, just beyond a windshield web of shattered glass. The front of the car was an accordion of crushed steel. I was still in the driver's seat. We were all still in our seats. Shit, everyone said at once. We were alive, though. In the weeks that followed the car wreck, my parents hardly mentioned it. I had been expecting consequences, like being grounded from driving or something like that, but there weren't any. The huge splotches of blood they saw on my fisherman's sweater when they met me at the hospital had subdued them. Thankfully, my friends all walked away unharmed. Then February brought the distraction of good news. I'd been accepted to college on early decision. My spotty career as a boarding school cast-off turned public school lawn urchin had finally ended. I'd made the grade. After that, I'd spent the last months of high school skipping classes more often than usual, drinking beer on the lawn of the War Memorial, or getting stoned in the parking lot of Angel Park. I figured I'd earned it, and Mr. Lemieux, the assistant principal, still gave me a big hug at graduation when he handed me my diploma. South High was the first school where the administration and faculty had actually liked me, no matter how many of their rules I'd broken. Thank you. I, I had actually marked, um, the, underlined that last passage, uh, I thought it was really moving because I thought it was, it felt like a turning point getting out of South um, because of that acceptance, because you, you weren't fighting or, or you, they almost didn't give you something to fight against, right? So up until then, from your sh shoplifting early youth to <laughs> your time at Taft, um, 
you know, it, 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 was, it was that you were pushing against something. And when you got to South, you pushed against something and all you found was acceptance. And that kind of gave you the freedom to relax a little bit and, and find your path, find your journey. I think it's true. I, I, there was also another huge factor in my life then, and that was Jack Summers, who's here tonight. Um, <laughs> Jack really took me under his wing at a time when I needed that guidance from an adult, an adult outside of my family who really showed that I had talent and I, I was worth so much, you know, in, in his eyes. And so I was able to really step up and, and become this photographer in high school and explore my creativity and find my voice and my vision. And... Um, and I was very dedicated to my work that I was doing at that time. And Jack would even sort of get me involved in exhibitions that he was submitting things for. And I remember we showed work in one together once. And, and that kind of validation meant a tremendous amount at that point. And it was a turning point, as you noted. There was another point, too, where you were in London and you, I, I can maybe find it. Um, and you comment that you had, you were, you were sort of, you were finally free in a way, that you weren't, um, hold on one second, Let's see if I can, uh, yeah, you said, um, the muffled sound of traffic horns traveled over the building to merge with a rumble of thunder splitting open the clouds. I could stand there as long as I wanted. I realized my life felt utterly my own. And it was a really, again, a powerful moment of self-identity for someone who, for much of the book and for much of what the book is about, was being defined by a heritage or by a family. And it was, um, I, I guess it'd be interesting for, to, to talk a little bit about how, how you did that and, what, and, and how art played a part in that. That's an excellent question because art played an enormous part in my path towards individuation and carving out my own identity. And my father was a wonderful example for me because he was such a brilliant photographer and took pictures of us throughout our lives. And yet his talent ended up in these dust covered boxes up in the attic. And, um, and his photographs really, except for a few that were out on tabletops at our house or friends' houses, were never seen. And this was felt as a great tragedy in our family. And it was something that was just always there. And I think I describe the, that the air had weight and texture to it in our house because of this tragic fact about my father's wasted talent. Um, he had gone to work for the Stroh Brewing Company instead of pursuing his dream, which was to be a photographer. And he'd been discouraged by his family to pursue that path. And so it was really through his example that I decided when I discovered that I had um, a dream of my own to be an artist, uh, it was really my father's example that firmed that up as a path that I decided I would take. And it's, of course, not an easy path. Um, there are many risks involved. And, um, and these are risks that I was willing to take. And, and, I, and so as I started to carve out my own identity step by step, later becoming an installation artist and then a writer, uh, I always reflected back on the story of my father and it gave me strength. It was, I mean, you begin by talking about your installation art and it's interesting, you're starting a memoir which mirrors that act of holding up a mirror of your family, you know, to themselves. Um, you obviously knew when you were writing this that that was gonna be something that everybody was gonna see and that there's an aspect of exposure in a memoir and a decision to be honest. Um, how'd that feel? <laughs> well, I think it was actually, as I thought about that, as I wrote, I think the, the, 
the person I was most worried about was my mother and her reaction. My mother's here tonight. She's been a huge champion of the book from day one. And that's meant a tremendous amount to me. I, it's hard to express how much that's meant because in the face of other family members who haven't been as supportive, that support has um, really given me courage and strength just to keep going and come forward with a truthful, honest, and, um, and compassionate story about what happened to my family and how we came undone. It's, uh, I mean, you come from uh, a culture, a gross point culture, a, which is conservative, you know, not politically, but it, 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 it behaves a certain way, actually, just anecdotally. Um, the filmmaker John Hughes spent his early years in Gross Point, and he was talking to his son once and was describing how all his movies, uh, Breakfast Club, um, Pretty in Pink, were born from his experience in Gross Point more than Chicago. Uh, because in Gross Point, it was so uh, stratified class-wise that when people said, where are you from, and you said Gross Point, they'd say, which one? And you'd say, oh, I'm from the farms. And they'd say, what street? And you'd tell them, they'd say, which side of the street? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Which block? <laughs> yeah, and there was a really very you know, firm sense, and still is, I think, of, of where you're from and where you belong. And to break out of that as an artist, and then to choose to, um, to provide a narrative of that, which, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, exposes that, is you know, an act of, um, I, I mean, I, it, it's an act of rebellion, in a way. Um, so that's interesting. It is interesting. Um, it's, it's definitely an act of nonconformity. I didn't necessarily think of it as an act of rebellion, but as I sort of kept going and you know, really had to stand up to resistance, um, it didn't feel rebellious in the sense that you know, the shenanigans I was pulling in high school were truly rebellious with very little consciousness of of you know, what I was doing or why. Whereas this time I had a tremendous amount of consciousness about it and um, just kept going. I just sort of, a friend once described me as sort of a freighter that just kind of went, mm, like just kept going and never gave up and sort of held on to what my truth was and didn't let anybody take that away. And I think really that's what the story is about. It's about how many times the truth was taken away from all of us, and um, and my act of rebellion at sort of taking that truth back. Was there a moment when you were writing it where you had sort of a discovery through the writing of what had happened or what it meant? Was it like where you were typing and you were like, oh shit, I see it now. The whole thing was an act of discovery. There was just a, a con I've, I knew for years when I, first became a writer and I was writing fiction, I would have these insights about this book that I knew someday I would have to write that was my family story and was a work of nonfiction and really my story, of course, but um, my story of reflection on my family. And it wasn't until my father died and the company had sent out their final letter announcing that dividends were over, the party's over, you know, the company has essentially ceased to exist, um, that I realized I had the ending I'd always been waiting for, and I knew I needed that ending before I could begin to write the book. And I began writing the book within a year of, of those events. So everyone here is probably working on a memoir of their own. <laughs> um, they should be. Uh, what, what, what would you say was sort of the hazard of writing? What were the places where you're like, if you're working on a memoir, you can fall down this rabbit hole, or you know, it, it, it works better when you approach it this way, or here's something that you need to tell yourself when you're working on it? What I've discovered, and there were many moments like that, but I was very determined to protect my family members and only include details that were relevant to the story. Because it's so easy to sort of go down all of these different paths and, you know, 
include de details that seem interesting but really aren't relevant. And so I, it became this kind of quest for almost a purification of the narrative itself. And, and it start, and so I would sort of see the rabbit holes and I would step around them. And, um, and I think there are all kinds of decisions that we make as we write, but the primary decision was um, the establishment of the voice, of my narrative voice. And once I had that narrator, which didn't take very long, I felt as if, of course, I had to show up and do the work, but it felt as if these channels opened and the story was just ready to come out. And it almost, I mean, in an odd sense, even though it took four years, wrote itself. I, I, I can definitely, I was just uh, in a dialogue with a bunch of writers and we were talking about how story emerges and we all agreed that you can walk around with all sorts of plots and things and whatever in your head, but until you hit that voice, it never starts. And when you find that voice, it flows. Exactly. Um, and what I thought was really interesting about your, and I think that's really well put in it, um, is that there was a narrative thread, there was an arrow that went through the book. Um, so it didn't feel like a compilation of all the anecdotes from the kitchen and then the you know, yard and then this thing happened at high school. It was like, no, this is a journey that you know, reaches a point. And I thought it was a very, very well honed um, telling of that. Thank you. Yeah, it was, of course, when we begin to write it in the first draft, we take all kinds of paths and directions. And then um, it's really the deepening of one's understanding. And in this case, my understanding of what this story was and what was really the story that I needed to tell. And that came through writing draft after draft after draft and just kind of going deeper on an emotional level with each draft. I think that was the key for me. You, uh, one interesting thing about the book is sort of the role of men and women and the expectations. You, t you spoke of your father and how the expectations of the family company kind of weighed on him. Um, and then clearly your brothers had expectations and, and weight and pressures on them. Um, it's interesting because it seems like almost as a woman, you were freed up from some of that and were allowed to find a path, that there was some freedom there, uh, which is, you know, wonderful um, and, and uh, powerful. It's a great point that you make because of course, the men born, in, and it had been this way for five generations, the men born into the family were expected to work at the brewery and were expected to have very good jobs at the brewery and were being groomed for that. And so the women, and there aren't as nearly as many of them in the family as there are men, didn't have that same pressure, also didn't really have opportunities at the brewery either. Um, but it certainly opened the door, I think, for, for the women to find, to figure out who they wanted to be in the world and to create purposeful lives. And it, it's a fantastic um, journey, the way that you've sort of laid it out, where, you know, you're, for much of the book, you're sort of finding your way and falling apart and pulling yourself back together while those around you are falling apart and trying to pull themselves back together, and the city is falling apart. <laughs> um, yes. And now, you know, you're here, and it's, it's pulling itself back together. That, that energy of sort of ebbing and flowing is, is um, an interesting one. And, you know, I, I think that the art is the thing that, and finding that voice in the art is the thing that gave you the strength to come back together. What, what is it about art that gives you that, do you think? Great question again. I, um, it gives me the freedom to explore the things that really matter to me and which may be one of the reasons that you know, my work kept, I kept changing my medium, trying to get at this truth that seemed like it was lingering just beneath the surface of things and, and yet 
was being held at bay by my reality somehow. And I, I started to understand that that was the sort of, the code could be broken, but I would have to go through the family story somehow to break the code and sort of get at that truth. And that became clear to me when I did the installation piece in my mid-20s with my six family members on screens, each telling the story, the family story from each family member's point of view. Um, and that played in a, a gallery in San Francisco in a darkened room, six monitors with six talking mouths, um, described in the prologue to the book. Um, that piece, it was not intentional that I would sort of open this Pandora's box of pent up emotion and, and, and grievance in my family, and yet that's exactly what happened. I, I just thought, you know, I'm sort of creating this interesting structure, and it's kind of, it was, I was operating from a very conceptual place, and it was shocking when all of those emotions broke out in the room. Um, shocking for the other people who attended the exhibit, but especially for me. Um, standing in the center of all of those voices and all of that blame and all of that reckoning with what happened to the family and, and you know, whose fault is this and how did it, you know, everyone had their narrative. And so that, that need to tell a story to get at the truth of one's reality um, became very interesting to me at that time. You talk about it a little bit in the book, but can you describe what happened immediately after your family, like literally that day after your family saw that piece? Well, my parents came out for the opening and my mother went in and listened to all of the tapes and was very interested and my father was afraid to enter the room. And um, just because a lot of the, I think, frustration and darker material was around him. And, um, and of course, that goes back to the fact that he was a frustrated artist and, you know, was not living the purposeful life that he could have lived. So what happened after that was, for me, really just sort of many years of continuing to make installation art and not addressing my family issues and getting more and more and more conceptual with my work and really avoiding those, those truths. And then it came to a point where my work was so divorced from emotion that I had a sudden, like, kind of revolutionary change of heart and a shift to another medium and had to go through some very intense soul searching to figure out what that would be. I thought maybe filmmaking, I explored that for a while in New York and then I, I started writing. But it wasn't for many years, it was many years before I began the memoir. Do you go through uh, post-traumatic stress when you come back to Gross Point? <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a funny place because it's, it's, you know, it's a bubble, as they say, and it's, it, I mean, when I, I joke that it is in it is in 1984 five still the golden retrievers and the rollerbladers and the day glow i mean it's in the absence of a whole foods <laughs> in the absence of a whole foods um i mean it, you know i like the mid 80s a lot um but it it must be um i mean it for you to come back and and go through it and feel how little has changed in a way you know there's the war memorial there's south there all the things that you talk about in your book. You know, kids from South are still using Detroit as a playground for drugs and alcohol and then coming back and pretending they're normal for their parents, you know? Right, but it's not, of course that happens in every community. It's not just Gross Point, but no, I, I don't have that feeling when I go back to Gross Point. I, I actually, it's great to see friends when I come back, but when I come, now, when I come back, because of how exciting it is to be in Detroit, I like to stay downtown. It's just sort of, it feels really nice to be down here. And so, um, and I love to see all the changes happening and, you know, eat in the new restaurants. And You've been to Gold Cash Gold? Have you been there yet? Um, <laughs> I think I'm going there tonight. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> 
So um, Detroit just feels like the place that I want to be now, but love to go up to Gross Point and see people and visit my, my dad and my brother Charlie are in the wall at Christ Church and go visit them and see how things are doing up there. It's always exactly as I remember it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nice. Do you want to read something else? Do you have another passage you'd like to read? I have other passages. I, I thought, should we open it up to questions, or do you well, want you me to read, read something well, else? Yeah, read, read sure. something else. It's a good book. <laughs> I don't want to bore the people that were at the Story Makers dinner last night, but I have, uh, I have a passage from an earlier section that I read last night that I'll read again. Gross Point, 1980. The December light faded so suddenly I could hardly read my own words. Rather than switch on the chandelier, I slid my high school application essay across the dining table, closer to the bay window. Snow was beginning to fall. The empty house creaked around me as I bore down on my paragraphs, determined to get down exactly how things had felt the summer before, when everything changed, it seemed, overnight. I wrote about my parents' faces, pale and swollen with sleeplessness, and the knotted feeling inside my stomach. Something terrible was happening. My mother had given up playing backgammon, my father had stopped leaving for work. I described the hushed voices, the closed doors, my gnawing sense that everything would come apart at any moment, that only a barely discernible tensing of all my muscles might hold it together. My parents sealed themselves in the library for days. Whatever you do, my father said as he pulled the door behind him. Do not come in here. Whitney and I sat on the porch watching TV, our blank faces masking our alarm, buoyed at least partly by the Brady Bunch, bewitched, happy days. My younger brother's auburn hair was oddly disheveled, his trousers an inch too short. How I envied my older brothers, both of them off at college, Charlie a sophomore and Bobby a senior. On day three, my parents emerged, drained, older, yet united in their conviction that we should know the truth. It's so awful to have to tell you this, my mother began in a cracked voice, the puffed wedges underneath her eyes by now a deep purple. But it's important you know your brother Charlie is a drug dealer. Her eyes filled up with tears and she looked away. My father dragged on his cigarette dismissively. We're taking him out of college, putting him into the Marines to clean him up. As my mother wept, my father put his cigarette into the ashtray and gently rested both his hands on her shoulders. I couldn't remember the last time I'd seen them touch. You must never mention a word about this to anyone outside the family, my mother said to Whitney and me with unusual sternness, wiping her cheeks with the back of her hand. Nobody at all. I felt the news and accompanying emotions seal themselves off inside my body with the ease of a closing elevator door. Drug dealers were something you saw on TV, not in my own family. I remembered an episode of Starsky and Hutch where the drug dealer lived in an abandoned apartment on the outskirts of town. Starsky kicked in the door while Hutch aimed the gun. I turned on the chandelier so that I could reread my essay. Outside, the snow was falling harder now, and a few stray sparrows pecked aimlessly at the frozen ground. My last winter in Michigan. Next year, I'd be gone, 
away at boarding school for ninth grade and away from this house. I'd been waiting to go since sixth grade, counting down the years impatiently. The applications all asked for an essay on an experience that had changed my life. And so while other eighth graders wrote about their golden retrievers dying, I wrote about Charlie's drug bust and what it had done to our family. The shame and silence spreading from my parents to us and then into just about every aspect of our lives. Charlie had been selling cocaine, a drug I knew about from Time magazine. I'd seen pictures of it, lines of white powder on the cover. My parents had heard the news from Charlie's college dean earlier that year, in the spring. He was expelled and under pressure from my parents, immediately enrolled in Marine boot camp in San Diego, leaving in early June. But as June passed into July, everything kept changing, and the tension in the house got only worse. Thank you. You can, um, you can see your roots as a memoir writer there because of how quickly after your mother says not to tell anybody, <laughs> you immediately put it into your application essay. <laughs> so it all... And they never found out about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like probably like two days later. <laughs> no, I swear, I'm not going to tell anybody. 